John Law is, is really the spiritual father of, of central banking. Uh, let me begin by talking about uh, another economist much, who, who wrote much later than Law, a French economist and gold standard advocate named Charles Rees. In 1951, uh, Charles Rees wrote an article, and he began his article with the following observation. He said that, it is said that history repeats itself. One can say the same thing about economists. At the present time, there is a writer whose ideas have been repeated since Cain, without ever being cited by name. He is called John Law. I would be curious to know how many among the Anglo-Saxon authors who have found, who have found again, all by themselves, his principal arguments, have taken the trouble to read him. Now, Reese went on in his article to expose the numerous parallels between the ideas of John Law and those of Keynes and his followers, and also of Irving Fisher and the quantity theorists, who are the predecessors of the modern monetarists. Now, in my talk, what I propose to do is to show that uh, Reese's analysis is, with one major exception, that is the, the modern Austrian school, still applicable in today's world. The three major schools of monetary economists are still unwitting proponents of the leading doctrines of John Law. Now, who was John Law? Uh, he's a notorious and colorful character in monetary history. In four short years, between 1716 and 1720, he almost single-handedly destroyed the currency of, of France. Uh, and he did so, by the way, uh, by implementing a scheme of his own for a paper money issuing central bank. Let me give you some of the facts of his life, and then I'll go into his, uh, his ideas. And after that, I'll show how these ideas have their parallel in, in, in the, the thinking of today's monetary economists and monetary policymakers. Law was born in, in Edinburgh, Scotland in April 1671. He inherited a great deal of money from his father, which he proceeded to squander on riotous living. Uh, at 23, he killed a man in a duel over a married lady and was convicted of murder and sentenced to death. He was uh, subsequently pardoned by the king, and then on appeal by the family, he was thrown in jail again, but being industrious, finally bribed the jailer and escaped to the continent. He made another fortune uh, within the six years uh, that he was on the continent by gambling. Uh, in, between 1700 and 1705, he wrote a treatise um, proposing reform of the Scottish currency, and I'll go into the ideas in that treatise in a moment. In 1708, while he was gambling again in Paris, he met the Duke of Orléans, who later became the regent to the young French king. Um, by 1716, the French nation was bankrupt. They were running massive deficits, so they had an enormous outstanding national debt, which they couldn't pay off. And the regent, remembering law and his gambling ways, appointed him uh, to, to a position which would, would, would hopefully permit the um, working France out of the deficit, or out of, out of a bankruptcy. Okay, those are some of the facts, some of the background. Uh, what I want to do now is to go into Law's basic ideas, especially as they bear on central banking. Uh, his most famous work was published in 1705, and it was called Money and Trade Considered, with a proposal for supplying the nation with money. Um, in it, he presented a scheme that would supply the economy of Scotland with money of stable value, or so he claimed. What he did was to propose a note issuing commission be appointed and supervised by Parliament to issue notes against the security of land in three different ways. First, the commission would lend notes at a market rate of interest for up to two-thirds of the value of land offered as collateral. Secondly, the commission was to make loans equal to the full price of land, which the commission was to take temporary possession of until the loans were repaid and the lands redeemed. So basically what you see here is, is, is a land backed paper money. And finally, the commission was empowered to purchase land outright in exchange for its notes at the market price. This is early open market operations. Uh, the commission would also be authorized to sell the mortgages and lands in its possession in exchange for its notes. So it would, would buy and sell lands and mortgages, increasing and decreasing the money supplies, we'll see. Uh, thus, by always standing ready to buy and sell mortgages and lands, in exchange for notes, law felt that the supply of and demand for money would always tend to match, and the value of money as expressed in prices would be stable. For example, if there was an excess supply of notes, people would quickly bring them to the commission and purchase interest-bearing mortgages and productive land. 
Uh, in that way, the, the, the excess notes would be drained from circulation and the inflation would stop. On the other hand, if there was an excess demand for money, that is, if there were a shortage of money, prices began to fall, economic activity became depressed, people would then simply sell lands or mortgages to the Commission in exchange for notes. In that way, the supply of money would always keep in step with demand. Now, this, this comes very close to what the supply siders are advocating today. Now, to give you a, uh, a flavor of how modern some of Law's ideas are, I'm going to read a few quotes as, as I go on. Uh, to begin with, Law felt that his scheme, this central banking scheme with basically open market operations, would do away with fluctuations um, in the price level, in the value of money. And he, and he, he claimed that it followed. His, that this paper money will not fall in value as sil silver money has fallen or may fall. But the Commission giving out what sums are demanded and taking back what sums are offered to be returned, this paper money will keep its value and there will always be as much money as there is occasion or employment for and no more. Well, at first glance, Law's bizarre scheme appears unrelated to modern monetary institutions and arrangements. Okay. However, a closer study of Law's work demonstrates that the ideas underlying the scheme closely paralleled doctrines widely accepted in modern monetary theory. And secondly, the inflationary potential of Law's simple-minded and cranky scheme is matched by the inflationary potential uh, inherent in current monetary arrangements, in which the supply of and value of money is subject to the whim of politicians, bureaucrats, and special interest groups. Law, Law had two fundamental flaws in his monetary theory, and I'll discuss both in turn. One of Law's errors was to consider money a creature of political authority. According to Law, the king was the de facto owner of the money supply, and he possessed the right and the power to determine its composition and quantity, according to the public interest. Now, Law wrote as follows. He said, all the coin of the kingdom belongs to the state, represented in France by the king. It belongs to him in precisely the same way as the high, high roads do. Not that he may appropriate them as his own property, but in order to prevent others doing so. And as it is one of the rights of the king and of the king alone to make changes in the highways for the benefit of the public, of which he or his officers is the sole judge, so it is also one of his rights to change the gold or silver coin into other exchange tokens or of greater benefit to the, pu to the public. The other exchange tokens, as we'll see, is paper money. Um, tra translating law into modern terms, money is a tool or a mechanism that is or should be deliberately designed to achieve certain policy goals of government planners. Well, let's move on to Law's second idea, and that is he viewed money as simply and solely an exchange token, or what he called a voucher to buy. Okay. Now, in, in, in this view, money does not have a value in and of itself. Its only value is the value that it derives from exchange for goods and services. And he wrote as follows, money is not the value for which goods are exchanged, but the value by which they are exchanged. The use of money is to buy goods, while money is of no other use. In other words, law conceives money as essentially a, an intangible or dematerialized claim on useful goods, having no value in itself. Now, from these two erroneous and really unsupported assumptions that money is a political creature and that is simply an exchange token having no value in itself, there are a number of de derivative fallacies. Uh, for example, the first is that Law saw the, the sole function of money as an exchange value voucher to be spent. Now, if this is the case, then hoarding money becomes evil and damaging to the economy. That is, holding on to money for, for longer or shorter periods of time without spending it becomes purposeless and also damaging. And Law goes on and claims that it is the, the job of the political authority, the de facto owner of the money supply, or uh, the, 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 the individual who, who would, who would um, oversee the money supply in the public interest, uh, they must suppress or discourage hoarding by all means at their disposal. Now, he talked about laws preventing the hoarding of money. But he finally came up with a scheme that he thought would, 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 be, uh, would work the best. And that was simply to substitute paper money for, for specie, that is, for metallic money, gold and silver. 
And in his words, as the coin of gold or silver bears the image of the, pre of the prince or some other public mark, and as, though, and as those who keep this coin under lock and key regard it as exchange tokens, the prince has every right to compel them to surrender it, as failing to put this good to its proper use. The prince has this right even over goods which are your own property, and he can compel you to sell your land and repair your houses on pain of losing them. Because at bottom, your goods are yours only on condition that you use them in a, manage, in a manner advantageous to the community. But in order to avoid the searches and the confiscations of money, now he did contemplate this, uh, it would be better to go at once to the source of the evil and to give men only that kind of money which they will not be tempted to hoard, paper money. But what is the nature of the harm caused by hoarding? Why was law and many of his uh, doctrinal descendants so fearful of hoarding? Well, he pointed out that a deficiency of circulating money and, and spending uh, would result in a reduction of trade, production, and employment. And under these circumstances, an increase then in monetary circulation, when you had this deficiency, would put pe people back to work and increase uh, real output in the economy. Um, and he, he wrote as follows, trade depends on money. A greater quantity employs more people than a lesser quantity. A limited sum can only set a number of people to work proportioned to it. And tis with little success, laws are made from employing the poor or idle in countries where money is scarce. Good laws may bring money to full circulation that it is capable of, and force it to those employments that are most profitable to the country. But no laws can make it go further, nor can more people set, be set to work without more money to circulate so as to pay the wages of a greater number. Okay, this is certainly Keynes before, 200 years before Keynes wrote. Now, one other point about law. He wasn't a naive mercantilist. He did not confuse money with wealth. He only thought that money was important to the extent that it set people to work, it set the economy to activity, and it increased output. Uh, and he wrote that national power and wealth consist in numbers of people and magazines of home and foreign goods. These depend on trade, and trade depends on money. So to be powerful and wealthy in proportion to other nations, we should have money in proportion with them. An implication of this, that, that is that hoarding can cause a deficiency of spending, is simply that the market economy is inherently unstable and prone to generate chronic unemployment of labor and other resources. Uh, the, so to law, an injection of new money in the midst of, of this chronic depression would not cause a rise in prices. Law claims there was no direct connection between increases in the supply of money and increases in prices. To law, the connection was, be, was between increases in money and increases in the quantity of output. Uh, and he, he wrote as follows. What I propose to do is to make money, oh no, I'm sorry, he wrote perishable goods such as corn, etc., increase or decrease in quantity as the demand for them increases or decreases, so that their value continues equal or near the same. Now what Law was doing here was saying that since we have chronic unemployment in a market economy, any increase in the money supply will be used to put people back to work. There will not be the increase in prices. There was, there was another uh, implication, however, uh, of the assumption that money is merely a voucher to purchase or, or, or to buy. And that is that ideally law believes that money should have a completely stable value. That is that prices shouldn't rise or, or, or fall, even, even, even a bit. And the reason for this is that he wanted to protect, protect someone who, who made a market exchange and was holding money to be used at some point in the future. He wanted to protect this person from fluctuations in the value of money. In Law's day, silver prices were rising and he was particularly concerned with inflation. Now, since silver and gold are market commodities, whose who's prices are determined by supply and demand, Law said they were unsuitable to serve as vouchers to, uh, to buy. In Law's view, this is what makes his scheme for consciously managed paper money superior to market-chosen metallic money. He says, what I sh shall propose is to make money of land equal to its value, and that to be equal in value to silver money and not liable to fall in value as silver money falls. Land is what, in all appearance, will keep its value best. It may rise in value, but cannot well fall. Gold and silver are liable to many accidents 
whereby their value may lessen but cannot well rise. Law also argued that paper money was superior to gold and silver because paper was cheaper than the precious metals, and therefore substituting the former for the latter as an exchange token permitted an increase of national income and wealth. And he had a very ingenious argument that w which has since been repeated and is still being repeated today. Uh, what he said was that gold and silver are, of course, commodities like any other. The part of them used for money has always been affected by this use, and goldsmiths have always been forbidden to buy gold and silver louis, a French coin and use them for their craft. Thus, all this part has been withdrawn from ordinary commerce by a law for which there were reasons, but which is a disadvantage in itself. It is as if part of the wool or silk in the kingdom were set aside to make exchange tokens. Would it not be more commodious if these were given over to their natural use, and the exchange tokens made of materials in themselves which serve no useful purpose? Finally, Law recognized that the best way to promote the use of paper money among people was to do it through an institution that they trusted. And this, of course, was the bank, or were banks in general. But more than that, two centuries before the economics profession discovered the insight, Law pointed out that fractional reserve bank lending increased the supply of money. So what he proposed to do was to have a fractional reserve bank in order to increase the supply of money. And the final quote from Law is that the use of banks has been the best method yet practiced for the increase of money. So far as they lend, they add to the money, which brings a profit to the country by employing more people and extending trade. They add to the money to be lent, whereby it is easier borrowed and at less use. That is, when they add to the money to be lent, the use or, or the interest falls. So he was arguing, in effect, for cheap money as well as abundant money. There was a great critical summary of Law's ideas by the economist I mentioned at the uh, opening of the lecture, Reist. Summing up Law's ideas, he wrote, Law's writings already contain all the ideas which constitute the equipment of currency cranks, fluctuations in the value of the precious metals as an obstacle to their use as a standard, the ease with which they can be replaced by paper money, Money defined simply as an instrument of circulation, its function of serving as a store of value being ignored, and the conclusion drawn from this definition that any object can be used for such an instrument, the hoarding of money as an offense on the part of the citizens, the right of the government to take legal action against such an offense, and to take charge of the mon monetary reserves of individuals as they do of the main roads, the costliness of the precious metals compared with the cheapness of paper money. This laundry list, by the way, Reese ascribed to the Keynesians. So it really in no uncertain terms, he was calling the Keynesians and the quantity theorists of his day uh, currency cranks. Well, now let, let me put this in, in today's context. To, to a great extent, the three leading schools of economists and economic policy advocates in the U.S., that is the Keynesians, the monetarists, and the supply-siders, share Law's basic ideas regarding the origin, nature, and functioning of money. Uh, all three schools premise their monetary theories and policies on Law's fundamental assumption that money is a political tool to be used by government planners to achieve certain policy goals. For example, a stable price level, low rates of interest and of employment, and of unemployment, high and stable growth rates of real output and income. Let's first look at the Keynesians. Uh, basically, the Keynesians view monetary policy as a supplement to fiscal policy, or government spending, taxing, and deficits, as a means for assuring a level of aggregate demand, which is simply total spending in the economy, that is consistent with full employment at stable prices. So that the Keynesians believe that basically, and they still believe this today, for example, um, the Nobel Prize winner James Tobin in, in a very recent book, still points out that the basic Keynesian ISLM model, which is basically a, an underspending theory of, of, of recession, is applicable now in today's world. So basically, the, the Keynesians believe that a lack of spending is what gets the economy in, 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 into trouble. And I'll, I'll touch on this again when I talk about money as an exchange token. The monetarists see the money supply as the most important policy variable available to government planners for stabilizing the price level. 
and by stabilizing the price level, they believe that they can iron out and minimize uh, business cycles. Uh, and also, to ma they, they believe that that is the sure method of maximizing non-inflationary growth of real output, goods and services in the economy. In, in, in some sense, actually, the, the monetarists are closer in spirit to law than the Keynesians. The Keynesians decry the, the gold standard as an example of an unmanaged monetary system, which allows no scope for counter-cyclical monetary policy. However, the monetarists deny that a non-political monetary system can ever exist. They dismiss the gold standard as an inferior or suboptimal government policy rule. To, to the monetarists, all monetary systems involve some choice of a policy rule. That is, all monetary systems are subject to political management. And one prominent monetarist, David I. Meiselman, writes, the proponents of a gold standard and of a fixed nominal price of gold have an excellent point in proposing an explicit rule. The main problem of fixing the gold price is that it is the wrong rule. We can do better. So they see it as simply another variant of monetarism. They want to fix the rate of growth in the money supply at 3% or 0% or 5%. Whereas they claim the advocates of the gold standard want to fix something else. They want to fix the price of gold. So they portray the gold standard as a massive government price fixing scheme. Now there's a reason why uh, they've actually been justified in doing this because or since the supply siders have come on the scene. Now at first glance, the, uh, the, the supply siders appear to be a, a refreshing exception um, to advocates of, of, of laws doctrines. Since they do advocate and, and sing the praises of a gold standard for its ability to automatically adjust the supply of money to the demand for money. However, if we look closer at the supply side proposals for monetary reform, the proposals of Arthur Laffer, Jude Winiski, uh, Jack Kemp, What you really see is, is a governmental price-fixing scheme on a, on a, on a massive uh, basis. Uh, what they advocate is what is called the gold price rule, and not a genuine gold standard. Uh, they argue that the price rule is superior to the monetarist quantity rule in guiding the, the political monopolist, that is the Fed, in its decisions about how, mu how much money to inject into the economy or to drain out of the economy. Uh, in fact, all three, all three modern schools of thought in this area are tied into a central bank. They all see the central bank as, as the linchpin of their own particular schemes. And in fact, the, free market, the generally free market monetarists, um, well, this view is, is defended by a, a free market monetarist, Alan Meltzer, in the following terms. He writes that a monetary rule that fixes the growth rate of money depends for its execution on a monopoly central bank. Economic efficiency is rarely compatible with either price fixing or monopoly arrangements. Yet, in the case of money, a monopoly central bank can be the most efficient method of producing money. So he frankly admits that in this one particular case, we need a monopoly. Okay. And as I would argue, and I will a little bit later on, that this proceeds from, from certain unsupported assumptions. That is, that money is a political creature and that its, its existence is simply for spending, which is the next point I'm going to make here. Lord's second assumption, in which he, he, he portrayed money as an exchange token, um, also applies to the modern world. Uh, for example, the Keynesians. Despite Keynes' celebrated distinction between the different motives for holding money, the primary analytical focus of Keynes and the Keynesians is on aggregate demand or total spending of money in the economy. Uh, the Keynesians emphasize that hoarding, private hoarding, due to what's called increased liquidity preference, people's desires for, for holding more money, maybe because of uncertainty of the future, uh, will cause interest rates to rise, investment to fall, and as a result, a decrease in overall spending in the economy. The economy will then be plunged into depression, chronic depression, okay, unless the government does something to offset, offset this propensity to hoard on the part of, of uh, the public. Now, the only remedy, as the Keynesians see it, for this hoarding uh, is for government to inject new spending and new money into the economy. Okay? That is, is, the, is, is for the government to, to run an inflationary monetary policy at the same time that it's running a deficit in its, um, in its budget. What about the monetarists? The monetarists, it is true, discuss money as a temporary abode of purchasing power. 
and they talk about money as one of the many assets that are held along a spectrum of assets by the public. However, following Irving Fisher, they believe that the key element in, in the practical understanding and control of, of money and, and, and business cycles is what's called the velocity of circulation of money. This is really a key element in, in the monetary scheme. And this velocity of circulation of money refers simply to the average rate of spending of money in the economy. Now, for the most part, the monetarists hold that velocity, or sometimes its annual growth rate, is stable. But they do point out that if you have a sudden slowdown in V, that is, if, if, if money spending, if the rate of money spending decreases, you will plunge the economy into a recession or a depression. Um, it, more importantly, they believe that if the stream of money spending does not keep up with the increasing amount of goods and services newly being produced by the economy, well, then you're going to have problems. You're going to have stagnation and, and depression. So what, are, what is the monetarist remedy? Well, they advocate what's called the quantity rule. They want to keep the stream of money spending, take into account velocity, the rate at which money is spent, um, growing at about the same rate as the growth in the real economy, as the growth in the amount of goods and services in the economy. They hold that if the Fed, the political monopolist, can do this, it's doing a good job and it's minimizing cyclical fluctuations, the business cycle in the economy. So their focus certainly is on the stream of money spending, just as Laws was, just as the Keynesians is. Now what about the supply-siders? Well, they basically follow the quantity theory approach to money but they quibble with the, the monetarists over how stable velocity is. Okay. That is the rate at which money is spent. They don't believe that, that velocity grows at, at, at a very stable rate over the long run. And in the last five or six years, they've actually been correct in, in, in this uh, belief. So that, so that as a result, they don't believe that a quantity rule, which fixes the increase in the rate of the money supply year to year, will, be, will, will always be efficacious in keeping the, the economy on a stable path. So what do they advocate? Well, they prefer what is called the price rule, and I, and I referred to this before. What they want the government to do is to target some sensitive commodity whose prices, or whose price, is a leading indicator of general prices in the economy. Now, some of the, some of the supply siders want gold to be this, this, this sensitive commodity whose price is targeted by the Fed. And very recently, one of my old professors at Rutgers named Mark Miles has written a book called The Path to Monetary Stability in which he claimed that the price of interest rate futures should be the key price that is stabilized. It's a very convoluted argument. I don't understand it, but uh, the point is that they focus on one or a small group of commodities which are leading indicators of inflation or deflation, and they want the Fed to stabilize the price of, 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 of these commodities. Let me give you an example of what they would advocate. Assume that the Fed targets the price of gold at $350. The Fed, through all the means of its, at its disposal, is to keep the price at $350, or a small range around that. Well, let's assume for a moment that the price of gold suddenly begins to fall below $350. This indicates to the supply siders that the onset of deflation is imminent. The price of gold is falling. It's a very sensitive price. It's falling in advance of an oncoming general fall in prices in the economy. So what, what should the Fed do in this instance? Well, the Fed should go in and buy gold or government bonds, in that way getting more money into circulation. As this money is in, gets into circulation, the gold price will then begin to rise. Eventually, when the gold price hits 350, the Fed should stop these operations. At that point, they claim, the oncoming deflation will have, have been stopped. On the other hand, what if the gold price begins to, to spiral up above $350, as it has been doing? Okay, and, and by the way, last year, some supply siders picked out $350 as the target price of gold. And when the, and when the price had fallen to $313, $310, $307, they were telling us that, that deflation was upon us. Now, I don't hear any of them telling us, now that the price of gold is over $400, that, that, that we're having a, a, an inflation. Okay. And, 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 and there, I, Maybe in the question period, does someone can tell me if any of them have, but I haven't heard it. In any case, what if the price goes up above $350? Well, then they believe inflation is close at hand. The Fed must sell off its gold in exchange for the dollars out there, the excess dollars, 
or its bonds, it doesn't really matter what it sells, but by draining these excess, these excess dollars out of the economy, suddenly what will happen is that the price, prices will begin to fall back, and the most sensitive price, that of gold, will go back down to its target level. And at that level, the Fed will cease these operations. Okay, it's more complicated than that, but that's the basic outline of their proposal. So again, to go back to the point about spending, they too see money as uh, important only as it affects spending in the economy. Okay. Now what about money as, as a measure of value? Uh, like law, all three schools of modern monetary theorists hold that money is a measure of value. Okay, not that prices are simply expressed in money, but that money is a measure of value. And therefore, that as a measure of value, like any measure, its, it's value should be ideally stable. That is, the value of money itself should be stabilized. And all of the three schools have schemes for stabilizing the price level, as, we, as we've just seen. Uh, also, all of the three schools, the Keynesians, the supply siders, well, not the supply siders, the monetarists and the Keynesians, the supply siders to some extent point out that commodity money is costly, and that is one of their main objections to it. The supply siders want to economize on the use of gold. That is, they don't want a full-body gold dollar. Okay, that would be too expensive. So they are they they themselves also adhere to 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 Law's point that gold uh, is, is a costly commodity. But they are willing to trade off a little bit of loss in real output by using some of the gold in government reserves. Though others uh, are willing to allow the government simply to use normal um, open market operations, buying and selling government bonds and securities to target the gold price. That is, they would have the government hold no gold and buy or sell no gold. You can do this. The supply side of scheme does not necessarily have to have gold involved in it. Now, the only sc current school uh, of economics to flatly and fully reject Moore's monetary uh, doctrines is the Austrian school, the school of Menger, Mises, Hayek, and, and Rothbard. Um, from the point of view of the Austrian economists, money is not a, a, a policy tool deliberately invented and designed by government planners for the achievement of their own preferred macroeconomic goals. Money is an undesigned, undesigned institution that evolves spontaneously on the market. Um, what money does do is to permit the multitude of market participants to coordinate their plans and their exchanges with one another. It's what, in the Austrian view, is, is a micro-sovereignty view, what Larry Lawrence White, Dr. Lawrence White has called the micro-sovereignty view. Each person has sovereignty over his own plans for exchanges, over his own cash balances, that is the amount of money he or she wishes to hold. Okay. There are no other goals over and above the, the goals of the individuals. And money arose in this way on the market. Uh, well, since money is an institution that emerged uh, uh, by free market processes or through free market processes, it follows for the Austrians that there is no necessary reason for political monopolists to oversee its quantity and purchasing power. Also, and again, I'm being very brief here, Austrians do not see money prim primarily as an exchange token. Um, money exists precisely to be held by individuals okay, as security against the future. If everyone knew exactly what their incomes would be in, in the future and exactly what their, their, their expenditures would be in the future, no one would want to hold money. If we were perfectly certain of the future and when we would be spending certain um, sums of income, we would match, we would loan out any excess money for that period. No one would hold money. Uh, moreover, uh, the Austrians do not see deficiency in spending. As, as causing great harm to the economy. Uh, what is called hoarding is simply an increase in the demand of, of the public for money. Now, how would one satisfy this increased demand for, for money, let's say under a gold standard, where there's very little increase in the supply of money forthcoming, at least in the short run? Well, what would happen is, given that people wanted to hold more money, they would reduce their spending. Everyone would scramble to, 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 to cut back on their expenditures. And in doing so, prices, yes, would fall. But as prices fell, this would increase the, the value or the purchasing power of money over other goods and services. And it would then satisfy each person's increased demand for, for money. 
So the market itself, by adjusting the purchasing power of each dollar, each dollar held in your pocket, does the job of, of satisfying increased demands for money. And in the longer run, if you have an increased demand for money and prices do fall, there is a, a very well-tested market mechanism. There will be an increase in, in, in gold mining because as prices fall throughout the economy, the prices of, of, of mine workers and the prices of, of equipment used in mines fall also, making gold mining more profitable. And also in, 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 in an economy, since gold is a useful commodity, people hold large uh, stocks of it for non-monetary use. And as each ounce of gold becomes more valuable in, in, in purchasing other goods and services, people will shift some of this gold over into use as a monetary commodity. So the market does provide the right, amount, the right amounts of, of, of new money when demand increases okay, over time. I guess the other point I wanted to make uh, has to do with the central bank and banks in general. Uh, since the Austrians are oriented toward market processes, and since banks at least partially have, have developed from, from governmental interference, we don't worry about central banks. Okay, we're, we're, not, we're not tied into central banks, we, uh, or banks in general. Okay. If you look at the financial services revolution, many of the f traditional functions of banks are being taken over. Large corporations no longer uh, go to their friendly banker and borrow at the prime rate. Okay. Most large corporations now use the commercial paper market. Okay. Uh, more, there's a secondary mortgage market now. Um, many different financial service companies make mortgage loans and so on and so forth. Um, you, can, you can also, for, 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 your, for means of payments, you can turn to, to money market mutual funds, which give you checking privileges. So I really don't see a need for banks in general in, in the market. And they would have to stand the test of competition. Uh, yeah, if, if the Fed stepped aside, um, if the FDIC was liquidated so that uh, the bank liabilities, that is the checking deposits you hold, the savings accounts that, that we all hold, if they were no longer insured, well, then they would be in the same position as money market mutual funds. They would have to keep their, uh, their, their, their loans very, very short term, as money market funds do, in order to be able to pay off their, their liabilities. But even more than that, money market funds, even though they, they, they keep their, their loan portfolio and investment portfolios very short term, also realize that there's a risk involved. There can be a stratospheric rise in short term interest rates that would, that would cause them not to be able to pay off their um, share depositors. Okay. So what do money market funds do? How do they deal with that problem? Well, it's dealt with contractually on the market. Uh, people are not told that they are guaranteed a dollar for dollar payback on their share deposits. They are equity shares. That is, in an extreme case, if, if a corporation collapsed whose commercial paper was held by, by a particular money market fund, uh, what would happen would be that, the, that the, share, the share depositors in that money market fund would not get paid back dollar for dollar. Now, I only know of one, of one money market fund that has not been able to, uh, or that, that has had problems, and its share deposits were paid 94 cents on the dollar, okay, which is a much better record uh, than, than the banks have had in, in, in the last 10 years, if you take away uh, the federal deposit insurance and its subsidized insurance. 